You're listening to Conversations in Atlantic Theory, a podcast dedicated to books and ideas generated from and about the Atlantic world. In collaboration with the Journal of French and Francophone Philosophy, these conversations explore the cultural, political, and philosophical traditions of the Atlantic world, ranging from European critical theory to the Black Atlantic to sites of indigenous resistance and self-articulation, as well as the complex geography of thinking between traditions, inside traditions, and from positions of insurgency, critique, and counter-narrative. Today's discussion is with Mark Anthony Neal, James B. Duke Distinguished Professor in the Department of African American Studies at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. He writes and publishes widely in cultural criticism, with particular focus on the cultural production and African American musical history of soul and rhythm and blues music. He is the author and editor of a number of books, including most recently Looking for Leroy, Illegible Black Masculinities, published in 2013 by New York University Press, and the 2015 publication of the 10th anniversary edition of his classic text, New Black Man, with Rutledge. In this conversation, we discuss the relationship between African American music, mourning, cultural politics, and mobilization in the digital age after our analog moment. His book, Black Ephemera, The Crisis and Challenge of the Musical Archive, the occasion for our conversation today, was published by New York University Press in early March, 2022. Mark, welcome, how are you? I'm good, John, how are you doing today? Not too bad. I'm really happy uh, to have a chance to talk with you today about this new book. It's, um, you know, I was really excited about it coming out. I I read your work when it comes out um, and always super interesting. Um, we share a lot of musical taste, but, um, and so it's always fun to read thoughtful stuff on, on similar kind of musical interests. But, uh, more than that, it's just always nice to see a real cultural studies stuff come out, you know? Um, and this book I think is a really uh, fantastic <laughs> exercise in that. I was Thank really you. happy. Thank you. Um, and it was one of these books I sat down and you don't, I don't really say this about academic books, but, uh, I had a hard time putting it down. You know, it showed it's up nice on my Kindle. <laughs> showed up on my Kindle, and um, I ordered the uh, paperback because uh, the cover is, is fantastic yeah. as well. Yeah. So uh, something about Kindle is never quite uh, <laughs> never quite <laughs> right for that. But you know, it's good to ta- have a chance to talk to you and talk to you about this book, which I I think is. Um, such an interesting piece all by itself. And then, you know, I'm sure as we talk, we'll get a chance Mm -hmm. um, towards the end to talk about how you think about the book in relation to your previous works. But I want to start out really with a general question I always ask in these conversations about the origins of the project for you. Because as you know, when you write a book, it takes over your life, uh, socially, emotionally, uh, in the home, uh, a lot of self-esteem at stake and so forth. So it's a real existential event. Um, so clearly something draws us to books when we write them. Yeah. And so I want to sort of invite you as, as, as uh, sort of getting started to narrate, uh, however you want, narrate us into this book. Uh, yeah. What drew you to the project? Why you think it's urgent? Why write this project now? Whether personal, professional, scholarly, and so on. Yeah, so, you know, I was coming out of the publication of Looking for Leroy, um, and, you know, the two previous books, Looking for Leroy and New Black Man, you know, I often call them, call them you know, all, I think of all my books as siblings, but these two in particular, I, I think of as the twins, because they came out of the same space. And, and at some point, you know, the books had a discussion with themselves and had a discussion with me. And new black man said, I'm really something different. I need to come out first. And, and you know, and then looking for Leroy comes out mm-hmm. later. Um, and so because they were those two projects and, and they went on for about eight years, I, I was a little exhausted, you know, after yeah. looking for Leroy came out. Um, but there was something happening with the digital space and social media at the time that I really wanted to engage Um And so I wanted to write a book about Black folks and social media, right? I wanted to write a book about Black Twitter. Um, The irony, you know, we met that that semester, fall semester 2013 uh, at the Du Bois Mm -hmm. Institute, right? And that was the the semester that I was going to sit and begin to think through what the project Uh, was. uh Um, 
And and so, you know, the earliest iterations of the book, you know, as the way I imagine it is really chapter three, right? I wanted to talk about this idea of how, you know, Black folks were digitally mourning, you know, in the context of hashtags and things like that. Um, but I also knew that I was engaging in that work at a disadvantage um, because I was not a tech person. Uh, um, you know, the computer stuff didn't come easy for me. The coding stuff didn't come for me. The digital stuff didn't come easy for me, right? And so I knew I couldn't do a project until I came up to speed, you know, on what was happening in terms of folks who were doing digital humanities work, right? I kind of fell into that, right? That's not something that, you know, I had chose to do. So when I thought about the work of, say, people like uh, Lisa Nakamura, um, even going back to Alondra Nelson's work, you know, going mm-hmm. back at, you know, 2002, 2003, um, I knew my skill set wasn't there to do that, right? So I was trying to think about what the project was to read myself up you know, to understand the yeah. digital stuff. And and a really important ally in that regard was Jessica Marie Johnson. I mean, I write about this in the book that, you know, I, I kind of, uh, you know, we, we had already had a professional relationship uh, around a range of stuff, cultural studies and, and that have you. But, you know, I, I basically apprenticed <laughs> with her brilliance, mm-hmm. you know, for, for two or three years around the work that she was doing in digital humanities. And it allowed me to find what my space was. And what my space was really was to talk about, you know, this transition from analog Black culture to digital Black culture, right? What yeah. gets lost, what gets gained, um, what's in the archive. Um, and so it allowed me to do the project in the way that I do mm-hmm. <laughs> archival work, particularly around music and sound, um, to gesture towards the digital, but to do something that felt, you know, really much more authentic to me in that conversation. Yeah, it's really, I, I'm glad I asked. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, these uh, responses are, I always find really interesting and, Especially that, you know, what you're, what you're talking about, you know, how to engage new forms of scholarship. I mean, it's always complicated yeah. in the sense of, you yeah. know, <laughs> the temptation is always just to have a, a quick, <laughs> broad take. But right. um, if you have some integrity as a scholar, it's a, you know. At some point, right. And, and the, you know, the piece that really stayed with me the longest uh, is the, the chapter that opens the book on Stax Records, because yeah. I was always fascinated on the history of stacks that, you know, throughout my work, the comparisons between stacks and Motown and what Motown represented is this kind of, interna- you know, international really crossover, black crossover brand and how stacks kind of doubled down in this Southern soul sound yeah. um, being authentic to this kind of gritty sound. And, and the ironies of stacks being founded by, you know, Jim and Estelle Hoyt, you know, these, <laughs> these two, you know, white brother and sister, you know, in Memphis, mm-hmm. um, this interesting figure of Al Bell and, and, you know, what Al Bell does when stacks loses the totality of its archive. Yeah. Um, and he needs to rebuild the, the the label. And that's something that I ultimately wanted to write about and helped me to think through this idea that, no, this is actually a book about archives, about Black archives, how Black archives function um, in a musical context, how people build them, how people expand them, how people monetize them, which is what Al Bell was able to do, or rather evaluate them in a way, you know, that he, they could be monetized. And, and that ultimately is what I settled on, what I wanted to write about. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about the the title and subtitle, which really picks up with a lot of what you were just talking about. I love the title, Black Ephemera. It's um, uh, <laughs> one of those titles that, you know, just a first glance, you're like, oh, what, what's that? Um, so I'm interested in why ephemera, right? I, I mean, I, you know, reading the book, you see, you know, how it how it guides the project, but I'm interested in that term and, and how you came to it and what work you think it does across the book. And I really love the subtitle that evokes crisis, challenge, and archive. And so to pick up with what you had just said, right, I'm curious how you think about archive here. And I think that in in Black Studies, this is always a question, like, you know, how to think about what counts as archive or what we mean by the archive. So I'm curious to hear about that and how this notion of the ephemeral functions and how you explore the senses of crisis and challenge. So I'll start with the with the title piece. Um, and again, to go back to Jessica Marie Johnson, you know, we co-edited a special issue of uh, 
the Black Scholar, um, mm-hmm. looking at you know all things digital. Yeah, Marissa Parham was a big part out, of our thinking out that process. Um, and you know, we talk about ephemera in the co-introduction that we write to that, uh, but it literally came out of a conversation that occurred, you know, a year or two earlier. Um, Rutgers had done this huge kind of big digital project, and and we were literally just having a back and forth conversation, and, and she kept chiming down on this notion that well, it's a ephemera, um, mm-hmm. and 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 it became something that you know just as a combination of black ephemera, I, I know uh, my editor loved it. <laughs> That's um, great, Eric Zinner. You know that that was the thing. Like we had been talking about the project for a couple of years, but when I said black ephemera, it's like oh okay, that's it, <laughs> right? That's <laughs> that's the book. That's fantastic. Um, and, you can and, sometimes have to fight over time. Yes, so absolutely. That's, that's a nice story. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, and I also know that there's a challenge, right? When you say archives, right? Folks are thinking about, particularly historians, right? They're thinking about boxes and boxes of shit, <laughs> you know, someplace yeah. that you got to go through. And that's not what I was talking about, right? I, mm-hmm. I was trying to understand, you know, on some level, right? And I write a little bit about this in the book, but, you know, my mother's bookshelf, Right. Where it had just like these odd combination of things. Right. H. Rap Browns. And, and, you know, my parents were not academics. Um, You know, my dad had a 10th grade education. My mother had a GED before she went to college the year before I went to college. Mm -hmm. Um, But she had like H. Rap Browns, um, you know, autobiography memoir, Die, Nigger, Die, um, Angela Davis's, you know, those collections of essays that she did in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just an odd assortment of things, right? There are a bunch of Essence magazines laying around the house. Um, you know, so I remember the first time I ever read Audre Lorde, you know, was actually a conversation that Essence had published in the early 80s between Lorde and uh, James Baldwin, right? It's the first time I actually okay. had read either one of them, right? In Essence magazine of all places. Um, Mm -hmm. she had an eight track. She loved eight tracks. My dad was more of an album guy, but my mom loved eight tracks. So she had this eight track, um, of Miriam Makiba and, and, and the opening song is a song called Lumumba, right? Which is about her son. And it's a tribute to Patrice Lumumba. And, and it just, none of this stuff made sense to me, right? I had no idea why my mother had any of this stuff in the house. We never talked about it, (laughs) right? It it was just this stuff. And, And I wanted to talk about black stuff, right? What is the stuff that black people collect, um, that, folks will think of as meaningless of having no value, but, but clearly have value to the people um, who have it. And, and for me, it was an older conversation thinking about black music. Um, I remember this is probably late eighties and I was tower records, the tower records up in the Lincoln center area, you know, 66th street and Broadway. And, and I was perusing through the album section and, and uh, a couple of folks came in, they wanted advice on a good album and the guy was holding a Grover Washington Jr. album. And the staff person comes over. It's like, no, no, you don't want that. That's 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 not really the jazz that you want to listen to. You want to pick up this this uh, John Coltrane album. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and as someone who listened to both, uh, I, I wanted to be able in that position to make the argument. For some Black folks, Grover Washington matters just as much as John Coltrane because they serve different kinds of functions, right? So I really wanted to talk about the different functions of the stuff that Black people collect as archives, yeah. right? And and so that's really what I'm kind of doubling down on, you know, in terms of thinking of Black ephemera. What is this aspect of Blackness? These things that we think, we think of as disposable as throwaway you know, of things that, that doesn't, don't matter. And, and ultimately, you know, this idea of thinking about this kind of quote, quote unquote, throwaway blackness um, is not throwaway backless, but, you know, maroon archives, right? You know, archives that are resisting being commercialized, right? And, and commodified in a way, you know, that they, they hold together notions of, you know, black liberatory ideas, you know, in this ephemera, right, that folks Mm -hmm. discount and throw away. But, you know, for some Black folks, it was, you know, it was meaningful. And and for that, I'm thankful for the work of John Aconfra in The Last Angel in History, you know, which was really the one text that helped me understand what I was trying to do with the book. You know, as for the crisis and the challenge of of the archive, um, you know, that was more me the music critic, cultural critic responding to the quality of 
of public cu- cultural criticisms you know, in, in this moment. Um, you know, I, I only mentioned Greg Tate briefly, right? You know, but, you know, Greg Tate, for the most part, for most of my career, has been kind of the patron saint for the work that I do. You know, someone who took cultural criticism serious enough to engage it on the basis of what culture was, but to do so in a popular uh, process, you know, what I often yeah. describe as popular post-structuralism um, that was accessible to people, right? That that drew ideas into the space, into conversation with each other that normally would, wouldn't think of as functioning that way. And there's that element of cultural criticism, right? As the internet has become so much bigger, the the mm-hmm. you know yeah. the public sphere of the internet, you know, where so many people are producing, you know, thought pieces and things like that. There's just so much less attention to doing actual cultural criticism, and actual engagement with, um, you know, the archive of the work. Right. That was the thing I loved about Tate. You couldn't read a great Tate piece, right? You know, and some of Tate's classic stuff is pre-internet, right? So it's not like you could read these references and gen- just make a Google, do a Google search, yeah, right? Yeah, you had yeah. to do some deep digging to figure out some of the folks that he he was talking about. You know, I, I never heard of Roland Barth, you know, as an example, right? Until I read, you know, a reference to him in the work of, of Greg Tate. We don't see that kind of work being done in, in popular uh, cultural criticism now. So on the, on the one hand, for me, that's part of the crisis. Too many yeah. people are writing about the Black archive without actually a real strong knowledge and, and engagement with that archive. Um, and because that archive is what it is, right, so much of it is, in fact, ephemera, you know, that's where the challenge of it is, right, to, to do good cultural criticism uh, is to be challenged by the nature of the archive, right, and, yeah. and the disposability of the archive. And how do you make people view the importance of what's in these archives, but at the same time, not make it so accessible, right, so that it can be easily packaged and reproduced? Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, and, and this is where <laughs> this is where we bond over a, a similar generation. Uh, you know, I think the function of, of Tower Records and and others is huge there you know it's it's uh you know i I think record stores end up getting in in sort of boring ways memorialized (laughs) in in popular films but you know what you're talking about really is is um a kind of education in the archive that comes both from conversations there but also from flipping through albums you know there's something about the size of the album and pulling it out i mean it's hard to imagine my own youth and my own thoughtfulness <laughs> about various things without that kind of browsing because it's it's slower right yeah it's not I, a click away it's it, you have to read it you have to hold it you have to contemplate spending money on it right you know i i can still remember you know as as a young adult uh college student you know summer breaks and i and i worked and i write a little bit about this in the book you know, I worked at the stationary warehouse um, right at the tip of Houston Street and Broadway, Soho. Um, and, you know, the good guy, he hired a bunch of college and high school students to do work. We got paid in cash. And I would make the walk from that corner of, of Houston and Broadway and walk all the way down uh, to the, uh, the part of the park row. And, and there was this record store called J&R Music World. Um, oh, yeah. Um, a little later, I'd just make the walk <coughs> north, the closer walk north of the Tower Records. But I would pick up two or three albums, right? And again, you didn't know what when stuff was coming out. And because, mm-hmm. you know, at 19, 20 years old, I'm building an archive. So it's about as much buying new stuff that's coming out than looking back on stuff that I want. And, and it was always with the object of making another mixtape. Right, creating another contained statement yeah, <laughs> of who I yeah. was at any given time, you know, ninety minute TDKX, um, and buying and building that archive and this playlist and these records, and and I remember the best part of it was always having two or three new albums and taking the long train ride from Park Row up to the Bronx. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would take the local train at every stop, and I would sit there and open up the albums and look at the liner notes. <laughs> before yeah. even listen to anything. And, and it's like that experience of listening to music um, mm-hmm. is lost, right? You know, when I began to actually do, you know, more public 
right facing writing around music criticism. You know, my thing was I, you know, I'd listen to some things 15, 16, 18 times before I ever wrote a word. Yeah. Right. And and we're in a system now where, you know, the album comes out at 1201 and someone has a release, you know, has a review, you yeah. know, up and posted 105. And I'm like, <laughs> what is that? Right? Yeah. 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 Well, I think, you know, that's, I, I think just even at the level of rhetoric, that's part of what the word archive can do is, right. is slow down our sense of, of what an appropriate process is. Whether Absolutely. or not we do it is another thing. But. Absolutely. And so I'm curious, I mean, you've, you've talked about it in some ways, but maybe to, to sort of lay it over the first chapter, this question over the first chapter uh, on, on Stacks and talking about Al Bell, you know, what do you think is at stake and what, how do you think we, ch- we, we are changed by, in our approach to, to black musical production, black musical culture, and it's, it's, it's cultural economy when we think of it in terms of an archive now on the one hand i think that that this connects to you know to the african-american intellectual tradition people like du bois and that closing chapter mm-hmm. on the spirituals um you know zora neale hurston alan Locke, albert murray ellison's nonfiction. i mean these are you know really profound works that linked the african-american intellectual tradition mm-hmm. to musical to, to the archive of music, to the memory of, 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 of sound. And so I'm just curious as, as a sort of broad claim, what do you think this, this language of archive, how it frames in important ways and draws out things about, about, about uh, African-American music, but also I'm thinking it, about it in particular in the first chapter where, when you talk about Al Bell and this, this vision for stacks after King's assassination, mm-hmm you talk about it as an archive project Mm -hmm. rather than marketing, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than, you know, the ways I think we've, we often, you know, uh, uh, you know, habitually move towards, you know, talking about, about popular music. I mean, insofar as we can call stacks popular music, but, you know, usually that's a marketing conversation, but, you know, (laughs) what do we learn by talking about it as archive? Yeah, I mean, that's the irony of Al Bell. He was brought on to Stax, you know, earlier to basically be their national promotions person. Um, he had this ability to break Stack Records, Stax Records. When he was at a radio station in D.C., he could somehow break Southern Soul to that audience. Folks at Stax recognized and, and decided to have him come down and be their national promotional person. And one of the first things that he does, right, and again, it it's – it is marketing, right? He's trying to sell. They're trying to sell more records, right? They're trying to read a, a, reach a wider audience, reach a wider audience. But for Bell, that was also a question of packaging, right? And packaging in that regard is also related to how you think about archiving things. And so Stax had only released a handful of, of full-length albums prior to when Al Bell gets there. The year after, they dropped 17 full-length albums, <laughs> Right. Yeah. You know, as a way to rethink the presentation of the music. Right. You can rethink about expanding packaging, you know, when you have a wider array of music to include in that. And and for me, that's an archival choice. Right. You know, the, the genius of an archive, you think about any art museum, you know, what they show at any given time is quite different than what they have in their holdings. Yeah. Right. The holdings yeah. is an archival project. Right. You make you know, you curate in any given moment. What, what part of that archive you want to put into the world, <laughs> right? You know, to show the world, to, to, to evaluate, to, to, to monetize, et cetera. So for me, it was always in that regard, a kind of an archival project, you know, for him. Um, you know, with the death of Otis Redding, you know, who's the label's best-selling artist, right? Yeah. And the loss of Stax's archive to Atlantic Records, right? Here you have a record label, right, that has a brand, but no music, right? And yeah. and what Al Bell does in the next two years in terms of the kind of artists that he brings on board, like the Staple Singers, um, like taking someone like Johnny Taylor uh, and giving him uh, what could only be described as a sexually explicit song, you know, in, in Who's Making Love that gets released. Um, you know, the fact that he had this idea of the soul explosion, you know, where Stax was going to drop 29 albums, right, in like a, a two-month period in June of 1969, 
And because Isaac Hayes and David Porter produced so many of these albums, he allowed Isaac Hayes his own album. And that album, Hot Buttered Soul, just changed the sound of soul music. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, for, for the next two decades. Um, you know, some of it is fortuitous, right, in terms of what happens. And, and you know, for me, Al Bell always had a higher calling, whether it was his early days as a teenager, you know, trying to figure out how to work within the context of SNCC and SELC and, and having to leave that space because he knew he couldn't be nonviolent, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. But but always thinking about this broader message of soul music to have an impact beyond, you know, the radio station, beyond record sales, right? You know, to pull together an event like Watt Stacks. Um, you know, we talk a great deal, you know, about Summer Soul, right? Which was an incredible film and an incredible moment. Um, I have no doubt, you know, and we don't know about Summer Soul for, you know, content, you know, as a, as a community, we don't remember that for another 40 or 50 years after it happens, but everybody knew about Watt Stacks, right? And there's no question that Al Bell knew what happened in terms of what we now know as Summer of Soul and created that a vision of that for himself in 1972 and had the wherewithal, you know, one, because he wanted to make back some of his money to turn it into a film, right? And it became the standard, you know, uh, concert film, you know, for Black music, right, for, for generations, um, I, he always thought, I think, outside of the box, right? And part of that was expanding this notion of what black music could be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I was, you know, you had shared some of this uh, you know, versions of this, a version of this uh, stacks chapter at uh, Amherst College. Amherst, yeah. Amherst, yeah. yeah. Um, it's always fun. I have to say, just personally, <laughs> it's always fun to have heard something and then see its uh, refined version. Of the book. <laughs> um, but I really, I mean, I one of the things I really like about that chapter is that it it is exactly what you were talking about, you know, the way thinking about a larger cultural archive expands our vision of somebody like Al Bell and of Stax Records. But it only expands our vision, right? right? As you were just saying, it doesn't expand Al Bell's vision. This was his vision, right? right. It was this wider, more expansive, more ambitious project and. Um, you know that uh, you know i'm really grateful for that i, I love memphis music and um mm-hmm. you know uh when i was reading that chapter i, th- I thought um about my own sort of future writings i would love to explore some of these similar things with high records you know yeah which was yeah. always it's really kind of interesting <laughs> companion uh, right. label in right. memphis, but that's it's that's its own uh, <laughs> sort of and then malico <laughs> records as a uh, aftermath of aftermath yeah I, yeah um speaking of johnny taylor um, well, let me ask you about the third chapter. You've spoken a little bit to this sort of in, in when you were when you were talking about your motivations for the book or what drew you to the project. Uh, I really thought the third chapter was really interesting and in in many ways a unique chapter in the book mm-hmm. in that sense that it puts the politics and culture of mourning mm-hmm. at the mm-hmm. center of how you think about black ephemera, right? And in that way is, you know, linked really in really intimate ways to the digital, the social media and and the emergence of, you know, the video album rather than, you know, something like just music videos. I I say just, I mean, those those, are cognates. Um, But I'm curious how you see that chapter in relation to the rest of the book. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking I want to talk a little bit about the chapter on, on Marvin Gaye and Aretha Franklin, but you know, you've just been talking about stacks and this is Excel, you know, the third chapter accelerates us in terms of timetable to the present in Mm -hmm. in such important ways. So I'm curious how you see it in relation to the rest of the book, but also how you think, you know, we need to understand the moment we're living in, right. At at, at whatever way you want to talk about the moment in terms of theorizing the digital and music and, and the place of mourning in that? You know, for me, it, it's the digital humanities chapter in the book. That's that's the one thing. Mm-hmm. And it was the chapter that was thought of in the moment in which so much was happening in terms of Black Twitter. Hands up, don't shoot. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter, all that kind of moment. And there were so many people doing great work that were looking for an origin moment for this energy. Yeah. Right. Whether it was the Gina Six, whether it was the Haitian earthquake, whether it was Hurricane Katrina, uh, 
um, and there are a bunch of other things that that came up within that context, um, all of which were legitimate legitimate ways to think about what was happening in that moment. I wanted to go back to an earlier origin moment, um, particularly as it related to digital culture, right? And and for many of us, that of course was Rodney King's beating, yeah. um, that moment where we finally got visual confirmation for so many of the stories and narratives that we had told about police brutality. Um, the fact that it was, you know, the capturing was so incidental, right? George Holiday just happened to look out the window and just happened to have, you know, what would have been there, a three or $4,000 cam recorder, mm -hmm, <laughs> right, to mm -hmm. record it, right? Um, but at the same time, we're seeing the emergence of the surveillance systems, right? You know, when you think about, Mike Davis's extraordinary book, City of Quartz, right, which is, you know, was is always in the back of my head when we think about, you know, this kind of digital moment in our lives and the infrastructure of digital surveillance that emerged in Los Angeles, you know, in the 1980s, right, which, you know, became part of mom and pop, you know, uh, stores, you know, capturing people who were coming into the store, right? So, and we always remember... Rodney King, we don't remember Latasha Harlins as often, right? Mm -hmm. The 16-year-old black girl, you know, who just simply wants to buy, a, you know, an orange Gina, yeah. you know, who ends up dead, you know, in this interaction. Um, and, you know, she comes up in hip-hop culture before Rodney King does, right? So black mm -hmm. folks are thinking about her in a way before we're actually processing, you know, Rodney King in that same <clears> way. And then for the Hughes brothers to do a film like Minister Society, which mm -hmm. that moment is a citation in the first five minutes of the film, right? Yeah. It blows up the film, right? It's mm -hmm. like it blows up. Whatever you were expecting the film to be, it gets blown up in that first five minutes with this citation of, of Latasha Harlins and her killing, though it goes in a different kind of way. I wanted to have a conversation about what that looked like in that moment. Uh, in part because not a lot of people were making those connections between that moment and what we were seeing in 2013, right? And obviously, right, very different kind of media infrastructure at that point in time. Um, but I also wanted to deal with, in this context, not so much the protest aspect of it, uh, but the mourning aspect of it. And and to this, you know, I give a shout out to, to Pete Rock and C.L. Smoove. Um, the, the piece of that chapter that doesn't show up in the book um, it's, it's actually a meditation on the song They Reminisce Over You, um, which, you know, they wrote and recorded in tribute to Trouble T-Roy, who most folks knew was a dancer, one of the boys in Heavy D and the Boys. Um, but they all came up in Mount Vernon and were pretty tight. And for me, it was the first moment, one of the first moments I remember that hip hop mourned one of its losses. Yeah. You know, Karis won and Scott LaRock a few years earlier. And then, you know, I remember that Pete Rock and CL Smooth and one because it's such an incredible song. Um, but it's it's later doing the context of the boondocks um, when they do an episode. Um, Riley was here and, and Riley is painting these murals around the neighborhood of graffiti artists. <laughs> and. You know, he's working with what we now know as the tree guy, right? It's a car animated version of the PBS Bob Ross, <laughs> right? Who's teaching <laughs> yeah. Riley how to do art and be a graffiti artist. And he does this be these beautiful murals on people's house and no one wants to believe that it's him, right? Because he's little, this little 13 year old boy. And he finally does one of his dead parents. Right. And that's when everybody understands O'Reilly did this. Right. And he and Bob Ross, the cops are coming out to them, they're driving away. And what plays in the background um, is a song by Tom Scott uh, that is a remake of a Jefferson Airship song. Right. It's an instrumental version of it. Um, that is the source material for the sample for They Reminisce Over You. And for me, that was such an amazing archival moment. Yeah. Right. Because that was someone who got it. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Immediately, anybody who heard that sample in that episode knew the reference was to Pete Rock and CL Smooth, which was a morning song, right? Which then gets recalibrated in this episode of The Boondocks, right? In a moment to acknowledge morning, right? And I was like, okay, there's some really interesting stuff here going on in the archive. And, and yeah. though I ultimately don't include that in the book, 
I wanted to look at these earlier moments of Black Mourning, right, and how it shows up in the music, right? So to be able to write about Martin Luther King's death, you know, for me, the most arresting mo- moment in the documentary from um, from Birmingham to Memphis about Martin Luther King is listening to Nina Simone sing uh, Why the King of Love mm-hmm. is Dead. Um, really hard. I first saw the documentary when I was 17, 18 years old and, you know, spent a good 15 years trying to find the song, <laughs> right? Again, this is before Google, mm-hmm. right? You know, mm-hmm. I can't just put on my phone and figure out what the hell is playing. Um, so I had a kind of relationship with that, but also Max Roach's tribute album, to that moment, um, you know, him working with a, a gospel choir to do a song that more deliberately mourns what happens in that moment. And so I wanted to look at these texts that dealt with different aspects of mourning, um, talking about Jackie Wilson um, and, you know, his performance of Danny Boy. Um, and, and, you know, J- Jackie Wilson, as I talk about in another chapter, you know, Jackie Wilson is, is a problematic figure around gender and sexual violence and things of that nature. But he was an extraordinary artist, right? Very popular artist, right? Really kind of the template, more of a template, I would argue, for Michael Jackson than James Brown was, you know, in, in that moment. But he does his version of Danny Boy, right? And it's such a, an odd song you would think that a Black artist would claim, yeah. Right. This Irish hymn that, you know, most folks have ever heard Danny Boy is at a policeman's, uh, you know, a police officer's funeral. Right. And he turns it into this extraordinary performance uh, of black art. Um, and it's like what he found in value in that song and what black folks found in value in his performance of the song was this connection to a, an extra version, extraordinary version of how folks felt mourning, right? And being able to claim mm-hmm. a song that might not have been in our tradition, but then gets claimed within our tradition, right? And then you see the number of other Black artists who actually covered the song, right? In- including Sam Cooke. And it's in listening to Sam Cooke say version of Danny Boy, right? Which is not as exquisite as, as Jackie Wilson. You know, finding out that Sam Cooke, in fact, you know, talking about this communal mourning, did a tribute album to Billie Holiday, Right. Which which was just shocking to me on so many different levels. Right. Because, you know, we don't think about Sam Cooke. You know, we think about them both and Billy Howes as extraordinary representations of black musical genius, but not necessarily doing the same kind of music. Right. And, and to be quite honest, the album isn't good. Right. He, he can't carry that in 1959. Right. Maybe if he had done that project later, maybe it comes off a little better. But the idea that it was important for him to do a tribute album for um, Billy Holiday, much the way the Supremes do a tribute album for Sam Cooke mm-hmm, when he mm-hmm. dies, you know, five years later, it just doesn't make sense, right? But it is this practice of mourning in the Black community and finding outlets in music, right, to do a shared communal mourning process that I wanted to write about in that chapter, beginning with the digital moment and deliberately going back, you know, to the analog archives to look at other examples of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I I like so many things about that, especially that you know these these moments of reminder that you know in in twenty twenty two, twenty twenty one, whenever you know the we locate the moment as you know it's a funny thing about books, right? They come out, but they like were written you know a couple right, of years right, before, right? But in the in our contemporary moment, I you know I think we seem sort of as a as a culture to be com- more deeply committed than ever to everything is new today. Yeah. And I really like that, you know, exposition of, of that particular aspect of the archive and uh, as showing a continuity, right? Yeah. These, these yeah. twists and turns. And, you know, I mean, I think about, you know, myself just to go, you know, go back to, you know, more conventional sort of writerly archive of, of African-American thought you know, for both Frederick Douglass and Du Bois, you know, mm. the spirituals, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's much mm-hmm. more um, occasional in, in Douglass's narrative, but, um, and much more prominent in Souls of Black Folk. But for both of them, this ability to, to hear the sounds of slavery in the spirituals right. and right. that reproduction of it across time was not just a sort of respectful sort of almost like a funeral song or something. It was about um, understanding, you know, a, a sense of ritual and foundation. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, and that, 
And so, um, you know, I, I like the way that that third chapter makes these connections across various kinds of sounds. And, um, you know, I'm always here for something that <laughs> reminds us that we're not like living in the first time anyone has thought about this stuff, but also the ways that maybe, you know, the increasingly ephemeral yeah. aspects of, of digital culture. Um, you know, I'm curious what you think about this. It strikes me that the, 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 the social media, the digital moment of all of this makes that all the more, um, all the more precarious makes the ephemera all the more precarious. I mean, how many times have we seen a tweet that says something really important that captures uh, an affect captures a, 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 you know, an unspoken, a silent moment in a moment of catastrophe of death of mourning. And we can't find it. We can't find it. Right. It gets lost. And screenshots Uh, are one thing, but I don't habitually hit the screenshot, you know, And, and, and the ephemeral, uh, there is so much more precarious than you know uh, the record store. Oh, absolutely, um, absolutely. As hard as it is, as you said, sometimes you know, you know about an album. I mean, I have my have my own versions of these things, and you go try to find it for you know a year. <laughs> there is nothing quite like finding that thing. The piece of vinyl, yeah. <laughs> a you know library sale or something like that. <laughs> Well, let me ask you, uh, thinking just about, about musical traditions, um, shift from mourning to playbook, uh, mm. songbook, sorry, not playbook, mm-hmm. songbook. Mm-hmm. Um, the penultimate chapter is, is, I really loved, uh, you know, you talk about Marvin Gaye and Aretha Franklin, and um, uh, I think the writing in that chapter is, is really fantastic. And uh, I imagine you writing that thinking, if I'm going to write about arguably the two greatest geniuses of, of American music uh, better be at my best. Uh, I think the writing's fantastic, but you take up this uh, convention, um, the American songbook mm. and how Marvin Gaye sort of was situated himself in relation to that, to record and prove his command over something like that. But that, uh, you know, Aretha Franklin was really up to something very different, which maybe we could call like a counter songbook or, or yeah. even something that, that tries to undermine the very idea of the songbook as an idea or ideal. I'm just curious what drew you to that particular question of, of the American songbook. I know that it's a trope, you know, that we use to talk about sort of American classics, but it's not just a, you don't just pick it up as a trope to say, well, let's look at people who do the American songbook, you know, Rod Stewart singing class, you know, whatever. Right. But that, you know, that rivalry, as you say, of with somebody like Sinatra, you know, imagined sort of like, what can we do, Marvin Gaye, what can we do to, to address that, to, 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 you know, to make something like that. But Aretha Franklin has something very different. So it's just really an open question. Like what, what drew you to this particular question of the American songbook with Marvin Gaye and Aretha Franklin? And where do you think the questions lead you in the chapter? I'll start with the Aretha piece, um, and and I talk about Aretha in many different contexts in the book. My parents, you know, when I was five years old, um, and it's the the nineteen seventy one, and it's the year that makes me everything that I do now. I can point to these three concerts that my parents either by themselves or together took me to in 1971. So as my dad and I seeing the Supremes at the Apollo in the spring of 1971, minus Diana Ross, it's my mother taking me to see the Jackson Five at Madison Square Garden in the fall of 1971. Um, and, and I remember both of those, but it's a great concert, you know, for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember both of those concerts, but not the way that I remembered us going to the Apollo in June of 1971 to see Aretha Franklin. One, because it was both of my parents who were there. Um, I can remember seeing the late King Curtis as her band leader, you know, as, as vividly as I remember anything, you know, from that point in my age, you know, at that point in my life. And, and my mother was a really big Aretha Franklin fan. So unlike when I saw Diana Ross' Supremes, I didn't know all the songs. Right? With Aretha Franklin, I knew the songs. 
Okay. Uh, and, and I often talk about, you know, by the time that live at the Fillmore West comes out, right, which I actually think Pound for Pound might be a greater album than Amazing Grace, right? I, I don't say that outright in the chapter, but I, I sort of allude to that because Amazing Grace doesn't happen without Live at the Fillmore West. Um, but by the time I heard F Live at the Fillmore West a year later, right, it was the same concert tour that she recorded that that came to New York, that came to Apollo in 1971. So, you know, with the absence of the, the appearance of Ray Charles, right, I already had an emotional relationship to that material. And so, you know, I've written about Aretha Franklin a great deal in my career, um, but beginning about probably about 15 years ago, um, I wanted to look at a different Aretha. You know, everyone talks about the Atlantic years and, and rightfully so right, where she became ground zero for Black musical genius, really for about, you know, at her peak for about a decade, you know, from 67 to 77, you know, she was unmatched in that regard. Um, you know, the only person who had a greater run in that period of time, I would argue, was Stevie. You know, his period from, you know, 72 to 79 or 72 to 80. But there was this body of work that no one ever talked about the Columbia years, right? In which she was recording three, four albums a year. I mean, and it was so much material. And, you know, I did radio when I was a kid. Not, not when I was a kid, but as a college student in graduate school, I did a radio program called Soul Expressions. Got up on Sunday morning, seven o'clock, and programmed everything from jazz to gospel music, um, and I had the run of the archive, right? So there's, you know, I had my own stuff, but they had this immense record collection, right? And it was just so much stuff that was there that no one ever played, right? Because it was a college radio station. They were more concerned with the new stuff that was coming in. Um, I, I will say that I, I liberated um, <laughs> <laughs> some things from the archive. <laughs> my, my cherished copy of Eugene McDaniel's uh, Headless Heroes of the Apocalypse, um, you know, was liberated from that record collection right for, before they reissued the vinyl a few years ago. Um, but that's when... Uh, Sony dropped this kind of collection of her Columbia years. Um, and I started playing it on my radio program. And this stuff with me that was absolutely extraordinary, right? It didn't sound like the early stuff, right? And I, I mean, the later stuff, the Atlantic stuff, and, and I didn't quite at the time have the language to describe what I was hearing, but it was Aretha singing the American Songbook, right? You know, she was singing all those things, right? And what struck me as extraordinary is that here we have an example of, of, of a black woman vocalist who everybody understands her extraordinary talent, but we only talk about it in the context of her relationship to stuff that's identifiably black music. But she's singing the same songs that a Sinatra would sing or Barbara Streisand would sing or Tony Bennett would sing. And none of those folks could sing anything that we think of as an Aretha song. Yeah. So she's, you know, just an extraordinary talent in her ability to take some of these songs and and cover them and bring something unique. And, and when I understood the language of mastery, right, you know, what she's doing in these moments, she's not just covering songs, right? She's trying to achieve a mastery of genre. Mm -hmm. And she's moving from genre to genre, right? Yeah. And so when you hear her sing Donna Washington's music, right, and I would argue that as a vocalist, you know, what we now understand as Aretha Franklin's voice, she locates it in her covering of Dinah Washington's catalog, right? But it's not as if she's aping Dinah Washington, right? She's taking some of those impulses and, and turning it into something else. And for me, the extraordinary moment there, you know, Dinah Washington does a cover of a, of a Hank Williams Sr. song, um, and, and Aretha covers this on this album, a tribute that she does to uh, Donna Washington. And, and when you hear this song, it's like, oh, that's the birth of Aretha as we know it, right? Mm -hmm. The sound of Aretha, we can hear it on her covering Donna Washington, covering Hank Williams Sr., right? And it's just that moment, wow, Aretha Franklin covered Hank Williams Sr., right? Who would have thunk? Yeah. And then when you think about the broader 
apparatus at Columbia at that time, right? You know, she gets signed by John Hammond, you know, the same John Hammond that's responsible for the career of Billie Holiday, right? So John Hammond understood this unique talent um, that he wanted to create as a new Billie Holiday, right? But Aretha's a very different singer. She has different musical backgrounds. She has different talent. She has different tastes. She's at Columbia at the same time that Barbara Streisand is at Columbia. They are recording some of the same material. In fact, Aretha does a version of People, right, that stays in the archive and can for 30 years before anybody hears it, right, because there was a choice that was made, right? Yeah. Who's the one that we're going to push to cross over? And it was Streisand, right, and not Aretha Franklin, and and for all kinds of obvious reasons, right? You know, could you cross over someone like Aretha Franklin um, to an audience that was looking for Barbara Streisand in that moment? And you probably couldn't, Right. You know, her voice was more powerful than, say, a Nancy Wilson, right? Her voice was more powerful than a Dionne Warwick. You know, I think Columbia wanted that kind of bluesy Dinah Washington sound from Aretha Franklin. Yeah. But she could do that already, right? Mm-hmm. She wasn't mm-hmm. interested in that, right? She was trying to work on her chops to do other kinds of things. Um, and what it means that by the time we get the fully mature Aretha, and, and what I will think of as her her most talented and and extraordinary period, you know, really from 1971 to 1974, you know, both in the string of albums like Amazing Grace and and Live at the Fillmore West, but also an album like Young, Gifted, and Black, um, Let Me In Your Life, right? You know, when she's now writing her own music, right? And of course, she's always accompanying herself. There's just something extraordinary there that doesn't necessarily sell records, Right. You know, after those early great hits, you know, 67, 68, 69, you know, she's not selling records the same way. Right. But she is functioning at such a high artistic level um, that we had just never seen before. Right. So she was unmatched. Yeah. Right. And, and this kind of mastery of of the archive. And would we get an amazing grace besides the performances and, and what it means to gospel music? but her willingness to take these different songwriters and put them in conversation, right? The idea of mashing Precious Lord and You Got a Friend, right? That gives a cosign, (laughs) right, you know, to the songwriter, uh, Carole King, you know, who does her great hit, you know, You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Man, like, like a Natural Woman. You know, so she records Carol King in this moment, the cosign, her importance, you know, as a singer songwriter in that era, but puts her in conversation with Thomas Dorsey yeah. and Precious Lord to elevate Thomas Dorsey in that moment to say both of these are important American songwriters. And she was the only voice that could pull that off. So that's, you know, that's part of the Aretha piece, right? Um, when all is said and done, if I'm listening, if I want to listen to a period of Aretha, I'm going to those Columbia records before I go to the Atlantic ones, right? Because I just think she's doing some extraordinary artistic things in those moments. The Marvin Gaye thing is a little bit more complicated. Um, You know, I I was a big Marvin Gaye fan. I loved what the technology allowed him to do on what's going on. But in particular, let's get it on when you start to hear him layering these voices. Um, And, you know, and... Atlantic, uh, not Atlantic, Motown and Sony, right? You know, they're the folks who have the two very different archives of of Marvin Gaye's music. The late stuff, of course, is with Sony. The early stuff is with Motown. And Sony releases this album in 1985, a year after his death, called Romantically Yours. And it's this collection of these songs that were charted by Bobby Scott, these kind of standards, Fly Me to the Moon and stuff like that. And I'm listening to as a as a 19 and 20 year old, and I'm like, I don't know what this is, right? I've I've never heard him sing songs like this. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound like soul music, but there's something about it that I really like. And then Motown released uh, one of its first box sets of music of Marvin's music in 1990, and collected more of these songs, and you know doing the linear notes, the liner notes piece, you know, I, I found out that he had been working on this collection of albums of, of an album called Vulnerable of these songs, these torch songs that he had paid Bobby Scott to arrange 
in the 1960s um, and had spent the last 20 years of his life trying to perfect. And I wanted to tell that story, right? And, and I'm not a musicologist or an ethnomusicologist. So I can't really, in a musical term, tell people what I'm hearing. Yeah, right. Yeah. <clears throat> That's, you know, as someone who writes so much about music, the limits of my musical criticism is that I don't know music that way. Yeah. Right? So, so I tend to talk about the cultural import of music, right? But there was something going on in these songs, it's like, I I need to figure out a way into this. And so the American Songbook gave me that. Um, The mythology of Marvin Gaye being signed to Motown and wanting to be the next Frank Sinatra, right? His lifelong connection to Sinatra's in the wee small hours of the morning, you know, which of course I then had to go out and find and listen to and understand, you know, what these reference points are to read the cultural history of in the wee small hours of the morning in terms of what it meant for Sinatra's career and how people were critical of that album because it was too emotive, right? It was too much of a response of the, the breakup, you know, of his love of his relationship with Ava Gardner that people were questioning, right? His masculinity in the context of this, right? Because it presented Sinatra as fragile and vulnerable, And how that was where Marvin Gaye wanted to come into this conversation. But he couldn't sell any records, right? Did a couple of albums, right? Didn't sell anything. They repackage him as a rhythm and blues singer, right? And of course, he becomes Motown's most successful solar singer, right? I Heard It Through the Grapevine is the best-selling Motown song from the 1960s, right? Uh, So he's this incredible star, right? He decides to go to political route, which, you know, in some level was Marvin trying to blow up his career, (laughs) as Barry Gordy told him. But at the same time, he's continually working on these songs, right? And so he buys his own studio, you know, in the early 1970s. It's, It's called Marvin's Room. And he's sitting in there with these 10 songs from Bobby Scott, and he's recording over and over the tracks, right? You know, after Scott does the original arrangements, he never works with Scott again, right? He just has these backing tracks and he's adding more vocals to it and, you know, doing this stuff over the course of 15, you know, 16 years. And the thing that was important for me to start that chapter with is that, you know, in in 2011, you know, Drake records a song called Marvin's Room, which always struck me as like, what the hell is this song about, <laughs> right? And and let's understand, right? Every Drake song is about the same thing, right? I loved her. She left me. I want to be friends. She doesn't want to be friends anymore, right? That's, that's every Drake song <laughs> yeah. that, that you ever heard. And so Marvin's Room is a version of that. But then I realized that he recorded it in the studio um, that's now owned by some other folks who deliberately renamed it Marvin Studio because it's the same studio that Marvin Gaye had in the 70s. And so something about this studio positioned Drake to do work around the idea of the interiority uh, of of himself, right? That he's drawn directly from this legacy of Marvin Gaye and these vulnerable sessions, right? Think about the title, right? Vulnerable sessions, right? This is Marvin Gaye digging into his own, you know, interiority, right? When you read David Ritz's uh, biography of Marvin Gaye, Um, He talks about, you know, at various points, you know, Marvin talks to him about these songs that he plays for him. And it's like feeling in the 1960s that he had not lived enough to be able to pull those songs off. But by the time we get to the early 1980s and he's trying to put the finishing touches on these things, you know, he, he feels as though he's lived the kind of life to be able to convey the depth of pain and interiority that he's trying to explore in this album, right? And and it's it's, you know, I don't think he ever intended for it to be released commercially. I, I think this was him trying to keep track of his own development as a vocalist in relationship to the emotive nation notion of these songs. You know, Motown finally releases it um, you know, a decade after his death and, and thankfully, right, because it's now out in the world. And I was fortunate to to for the last 15 years, have a professional relationship with Harry Wanger. Harry Wanger is an A&R guy at Universal Records, and and he's had the best job, I would argue, in the recording industry for the last 30 years, right? So he wins a Grammy Award for 
uh, James Brown box set Star Time, right, which he's producing. You know, he wins another Grammy Award for Standing in the Shadows of Motown, you know, talking about the Funk Brothers. His job basically for the last 20 years has been, you know, repackaging and reissuing, right, all this great music that's in Universal's catalog, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so being able to talk with with Harry about some of these songs, and and there was a great uh, professor who teaches music in Michigan who's been writing a book about these Marvin Gaye charts, right, and what he's doing vocally. Um, you know, the language that I needed to describe what I was hearing was suddenly in the world, right, and I could write about it, you know, finally in the context of this book. Uh, but, you know, to this day, you know, if if I get folks who got 10 minutes and like, play me something that I should hear, <laughs> Um, the Marvin Gaye vulnerable, vulnerable sessions are the first things I'm going to go with. I mean, one of the things I found in going through the archive is, you know, this is the benefit of digital culture. One of the things that's happened now, since you don't have to package records and ship them and sell them someplace, you know, the stuff that we can stream is is incredible. So Motown has, or Universal has consistently released, you know, these yearly collections of songs that were not released by Motown. So unreleased 64, unreleased 65. And I was able to pull, you know, from 64 to 67, different versions of these songs that Marvin Gaye was recording that never got released. And part of the ways that he was able to pull this off, because, you know, you know, Mar- Motown was a tight operation. Everybody was working with a producer. When they would go out on tour, one of the tours, they went out to do the Motown review and he got sick. <laughs> so he was left to his own devices, right? To be able to record stuff with Bobby Scott. You know, he, you know, he was looking at different arrangers and the one that I found that was most extraordinary, trombonist, you know, Melba Liston, you know, who we know is this incredible trombonist. Uh, Of course, she's a collaborator with the great Randy Weston throughout, you know, both of their careers. Um, But she's also this arranger, right? And so there are four or five songs in this catalog, you know, in which he's, using Melba Liston's arrangements. And it's like, who would ever think, right, that someone at Motown was working with someone who's doing jazz arrangements on such a high level? And so I wanted to tell some of those stories. So, you know, this is maybe a good point to ask this uh, question. And I'm asking you as the author, and maybe this is actually the uh, job of yours to do. Um, How do you characterize this book? You know, given what what you've talked about, which I think reflects the content of the book, you know, there's so much stuff on music. Uh, obviously, it's the focus of the book. Uh, digital studies, African American history, uh, cultural studies in the sort of '90s uh, sense of it. Um, but of course, you put all of these things together to do something very different than any of those particular genre of inquiry. So I'm curious how you place the book, how you characterize the book. I, you know, I think it is the best distillation of who I am as a mature scholar in terms of having the freedom to write about what I want to write about Yeah, <laughs> in the way that I want to write about it without feeling the need to a, make a name as one example, or having to jump through the various hoops that we have to jump through in the academy, sure. right, to, to get recognition, you know. So, so there was a kind of freedom in this book that's borne out both in terms of, you know, the nine-year period between the time that Looking for Leroy was released and Black Ephemera was released, that I could take the time to find out what this project was and not feel the need to rush it. Um, and, you know, I had been working for the, with the project for about five years and it wasn't until really the summer of 2018 where the aha moment happened (laughs) with what the book was. Right. And once that moment happened, you know, everything else was, was, was easy and I could pull together the things that I wanted to pull together. Um, I always think about many of my books as being in part. And I would say definitely that is for the first four chapters, a reflection of where my thinking had been over a period of time. And then the fifth chapter is the opening. 
Right. It's it's uh-huh. the chapter that is opening my thinking to whatever next may or could be. And so the fifth chapter is, is very different in that regard, right, than, than the other chapters, right? Some of the concerns in it, the way that I um, think about the concerns around archives and this, you know, it, it's the most explicit chapter, I would say, in terms of thinking about what Black ephemera is and this transition from analog to digital. Um, I, I won't say that it's my favorite chapter um, because of the music of Marvin and, and Aretha. Chapter four will always be my favorite chapter. Uh, but chapter five is the one that I'm most proud of because it's the one that I allowed my mind to take me someplace else with it. Yeah. Um, I can remember having you know conversations with Eric Zinner. Um, and, and one of the things we came to terms with about my writing um, and I think it very much speaks to what I wanted to do with this project. I, I am deliberately elusive <laughs> in the way that I write about ideas, right? And 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 I make a distinction there between evasive, <laughs> but you know, I, I <laughs> and I've always felt this way about if you do good cultural criticism, it's cultural criticism that makes you work for it. Um, that's the lesson that I learned from reading blues people years ago. That's the lesson that I learned. Every time I read a Greg Tate piece, yeah, right, you know, it's you know, I I need to be challenged by the piece that if we accept that the say music in this case, if we accept the genius of musical performance, the criticism of that genius has to reflect the genius of the object in the first place, mm-hmm. right, You're right. So it it has to it has to be its own piece of art, its own object of inquiry you know, even as it's looking at these other objects of inquiry in the context of it. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. at least in the fifth chapter, that's where I felt as though, you know, that's where that was coming together for me and, and raise more questions than I could answer, right? Which for me is, is, is really good scholarship, right? The, the pieces yeah. that raise more questions than it, answer, than it answers. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I th- you know, I, I, I like that chapter too. And, and I, I, as an author, I like this, but as a reader, I think I like it even more. Books yeah. that end in some ways in the interrogative. Open it, yeah. And, you know, for me, you know, a project like this, there are people that, artists that I've been interested in, and I didn't know how I was going to write about them, right? And this book gave me an excuse to figure out ways to write about them, right? So the time, the fact that I spend so much time on Jimmy Scott in chapter five, right? This this extraordinary musical artist whose music gets lost time and time again to do these great recordings that no one ever hears mm-hmm. because of stuff that has nothing to do with the art, right? The, the fact that it happens so repeatedly. And then why does Denzel Washington, right, in a movie, you know, Fences, you know, August Wilson, um, in which there's no musical, it's not a musical, right? And he decides to center, you know, Jimmy Scott singing day by day, right? In this moment in the movie, right? For me, it was a trigger, right? And not a negative trigger. It's like, okay, there's something happening here. His deliberate use of an analog song, right? Yeah. In this digital moment, right? It's, it comes up again in a film like Moonlight, um, you know, when they're sitting there at the diner and, uh, Hello Stranger comes on, right? Yeah. Barbara Lewis, right? Which is doing some yeah, narrative work at that moment, but but why that choice of that kind of analog song? Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, it, it's a deliberate choice to disrupt in the digital in that moment with the analog, right? And to be able to trace that back, you know, to to the work of of a filmmaker, um, you know, that f- folks who were coming out of that uh that LA rebellion moment. And, you know, films like uh, Charles Burnett's, um, you know, The Killer of Sheep, you know, which is extraordinary film in and of itself. Right? But that scene where Stan and the character who's only known as Stan's wife, mm-hmm. you know, are, are dancing to Donna Washington. Right. Yeah. And and again, the way that centers music in the use of music that we think of as ephemera as being important to the lives of these two characters. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to center that piece and talk about other ways that that moment can, you know, look at other things that are happening in the context. You know, some conversation about abstract art, um, you know, Margot 
Crawford was so helpful in her work thinking about, you know, the Black arts movement and how we think about Black abstractism in the context of Black art. What does it mean to create art that consciously resists commodification, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, or repackaging, right, but yet still holds meaning for so many different folks? Uh, so I, I would like to think that the book ultimately is a tribute, you know, to those folks who were creating art that mattered to Black people but it didn't matter how much money it made or how much it sold. Yeah. Right. That yeah. there was so, you know, that, that the value in itself was what it could articulate about so many different liberatory strategies to black life mm-hmm. um, in which the people who needed those liberatory strategies would get it yeah. if no one else would. It's yeah. And on that note of a uh, liberatory strategies, I, you know, um, one of the things I really like about this book and your work generally is is your commitment to letting the uh, object of study direct your writing and mm, your thinking. Mm, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think in that way, um, your writing uh, comes uh, comes across on the page as a form of listening, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, it's funny. You, you know, you say that you know you can't write as a musicologist, and that's a very it is a very specific kind of vocabulary. Um, but I like that your writerly voice, I think, is in that mode of listening, and really the the, the objects of your study drive so much of that. Yes, um, and then the way that pushes you, as especially in this book, into to notions of the archive and historical sort of rebuilding the the context of listening. But you know, there's also theoretical dimensions to anybody's work, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so I want to ask you also just about you know how you would characterize your own theoretical frame in this book. Because two words struck me, uh, fugitivity and maroon. So when you talk about liberation strategies, uh, fugitivity and maroon come out, uh, especially later in the book. Um, And those are both, of course, uh, references to historical moments and communities Mm -hmm. and political actions, but they also function in so much uh, Black Atlantic criticism as, Mm -hmm. uh, as theoretical frames. And so I just wanted to ask you to, in some ways, to sort of zoom out from the book for a moment and um, talk a little bit about how your own, what what is your own theoretical frame in writing this book and how you think it draws something out of the material you talk yeah. about that we wouldn't otherwise see. Yeah, I've always described myself as uh, an undisciplined scholar. And, and by that, I, I don't mean the the more popular notions of not being disciplined, right? Um, but in terms of my training, um, you know, I am someone who has always been committed to an interdisciplinary framework. Um, and, and as someone who came out of American studies, which in and of itself is not really a discipline, yeah. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've, I've often doubled down with that in my work. And so, my, you know, my theoretical investments have always been about, as you mentioned, right, this is the object, right? What kind of theory will help me best talk about the value of this object? Yeah. Um, and it just happened with this particular project, you know, for a bunch of reasons, right? You know, obviously the way that Fred Moten has been talking about fugitivity for the last, you know, since in the break, um, and, and the way that it has had a powerful impact on me and just thinking about, you know, what does it mean to stage the scene of fugitivity, right? What, what if the thing that we're always getting after in the aftermath of freedom, right, whatever that is, that the thing that is most interesting and most exciting is not the freedom, but the acts that we stage to get to that moment. Uh-huh, <laughs> right. Uh-huh. Right. Which, and so for me, the, you know, the idea of archives that are in exile, archives that are fugitive, ar- a- archives that are maroon, um, you know, just for me opens up a different kind of way to think about not the end object, Right, but but what's happening to get it to that to that yeah. endpoint, right? Um, and and it, it was really Sylvain Dioff's book, um, American Exiles, um, that opened. You know, because I had heard about Maroons, obviously in a Caribbean context before, but but her book, American Exiles, helped me think about it grounded in an African American context in ways mm-hmm. that I hadn't thought about it before. That that you know we can and talk, in fact, talking about an African-American, you know, maroon tradition, Mm 
right? Uh-huh. Whether we're talking about actual maroons, you know, from that historical period of time, or whether or not we're talking about art in this context. And again, you know, a shout out there um, to Jessica Maria Johnson, who helped me think about this idea mm-hmm. of, of mm-hmm. archives in revolt, right? You know, archives mm-hmm. in exile. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. I'm I'm glad I asked because um, they're they're fascinating terms, and you know, yeah. you know my own uh, my own primary specialty is Caribbean studies, and they really, you know, right. especially right. maroon, but also fugitive, uh, really resonate so much there. But seeing it enacted in in your book, I think, is exactly right. the kind of um, comparative work that we need. Yeah, and, you're, and you're you a do a really colleague. great job with that. Your former colleague at Amherst, Neil Roberts, right, gave me another, you know, set of languages, yeah. <laughs> right, to, to think about that moment in his own work. And and I ultimately, you know, when with all of these projects I've done, you know, it is the book ultimately is an, a tribute to the folks who were the primary interlocutors for me, whether that's on the page, right, or or in interaction, right. So I've talked a great deal about Jessica, for instance, um, but you know, being able to read and talk with Margo, Natalie Crawford, um, Shauna Redmond, right? They were important folks in my ear to think about what this project was going to be. Guthrie Ramsey, um, you know, I had never thought about the significance. You know, I talked about Melba Liston a few minutes ago. I had never really thought about the the genius of arrangement in music. And it's really Guthrie who forced me to think about, you know, there's a, there's the music, <laughs> there's a performance yeah. of it, but arrangement does something else that's very different, right? Yeah. And, and part of the genius of Aretha's career is that she could flow with anybody's arrangements, <laughs> Right. Yeah, you know, she, she was adaptable in that way. Right. And and not every, you know, artist can do that. Right. Not every artist is comfortable in that way. And and in that regard, you know, just one last shout out uh, to the late Richard Eiten. Um, and, and I write, you know, as much as I could write, you know, in the introduction of the book about Richard. Um, and, you know, Richard was my primary interlocutor um, for much of my work from around you know, 1999, when we first met until his death in 2013, every book that I did during that period of time, you know, Richard was the first reader, right? And, mm. and would give comments. He didn't always read the whole things, but just the chapter that was most important to me, right? Mm-hmm. I, I would send mm-hmm. to him. Um, and that last chapter in particular, because that would have been the chapter that I would have sent to Richard, um, is really a tribute to the way that he historically pushed my thinking. Um, and, and really to force me think to think differently as a scholar in his absence, right? And, and you know, our relationship was like that. Uh, I think of you know the letters that Albert Murray um, and Ralph Ellison wrote back and forth to each other, right? Uh-huh. I, I literally have thousands of email um, that Richard and I exchanged over twelve mm-hmm. or thirteen years, talking through various aspects of our projects, uh, and and I miss that in this process of this book. Uh, so that last chapter, in some ways, is a chapter is a tribute, right, to to his absence in the physical plane, right, but but still his presence in the work. I love that. Well, the book is out, <laughs> and uh, sort of a uh, last couple of questions. Um, I don't know how you feel about people reading. Uh, you know, my as I always say, my nightmare is that no one will read what I write, and then my other nightmare is that someone will. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And I imagine, you know, given what you said about about how this was a very different book, and that it was it was a book you felt most fully yourself. Um, I imagine it has its own particular kind of, you know, feelings around it entering now uh, the uh, readership. But um, what do you want readers to walk away from with this book? And I mean by that, like, you know, hopefully we don't write books, and you know. <laughs> have a kind of imperial fixation on what everybody ought to think, right? That that we're going to control their thoughts, but we obviously also want people to walk away with like a sensibility, right? To sort of walk different, feel different, hear different, see different. What do you want people to walk away this book? How do you want them yeah. to walk away from it? I, I want them to walk away with the idea that the Black Archive is expansive, and it's we have to be intentional in curating it and maintaining it and protecting it. Um, and, and, and and the end game is the motivations aren't always to sell the most records or to sell the most movie tickets, 
Um, there are other motivations in the art. And at a moment where so much art is simply commodity, Right. You know, uh, what we've seen happen in the music industry these days, where we don't even talk about records and albums anymore. We talk about streams. Yeah. (laughs) You know, we we literally talk about, you know, this digitized unit of something (laughs) that's not necessarily or have to be music. Um. And and I know we're not gonna that train's left the station. We're not getting back to anything else, right? That yeah. existed before now. Um, but we do have to be more intentional to protect the legacy of this. You know, my you know, if if I'm trying to explain this to a lay audience, I, I talk about Silk Sonic, which you know I don't like. Uh, I'll just be honest about that. You know, I kind of like Bruno Mars. I really love Anderson Park. Um, Silk Sonic was a calculation on both of their parts, mm-hmm. right? To 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 make music, sell music, um, and they do a cover for Valentine's Day of Confunction's Love Train. And I can't imagine in a world in which anybody can access access Confunction's Love Train, why you would need to listen to a Silk Sonic remake. Yeah. Right, particularly amongst two artists who were so talented, right, to do something original in that moment, right, and mm-hmm. and and you know, and I don't buy the arguments. Well, this is a attempt for them to teach what's in the archive. It's like what's in the archive is in the archive. Yeah, <laughs> right. It hasn't disappeared. Put in Confunction Love Train, <laughs> and you can listen to it anytime mm-hmm. that you want. I, I don't need a reread you know, from Silk Sonic that particularly doesn't add anything to the original. Yeah. Right. And that's what I loved about Aretha. Everything that she covered was something else. Would you listen to her sing, I Say a Little Prayer, which of course is a great Dionne Warwick song in and of its own right. And would you listen to her sing that? It's not the same song. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, And that's the kind of caretaking that needs to be done, you know, in my mind, you know, in the archive. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it's a, it's a great reference of a song in terms of contrasting styles. And, uh, and I do, I mean, in, in that way, I, you know, I have just as a side note, I mean, Aretha Franklin in, especially in that way that you, you, um, read her in this book and have talked about her in this conversation as, as a, an interpreter, right. Mm-hmm. If, if interpretation is probably too weak, but as a transformer, it right. does remind me of what Albert Murray says about Bessie Smith, that she's, a, mm-hmm. she's not a singer. She's a sorceress. Yes. Right. Absolutely. There's some, absolutely. There's some complete uh, transformation of the material. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's, that's the, that's where I, you know, I, I like Murray for lots of reasons, but I like that moment where he's like, genius is not <laughs> enough. It's got to be sorcery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but let me turn that question to you. You know, um, it's funny. You said, you know, you would come to the Du Bois Institute in, in 2013 to sort of get started on this project. And that's where we met. And um, when you said that, I was like, oh yeah. So you, but then I realized that's nine years. Right. Yes. That's, that's been a, a quick nine years. I have to, I'm a little disturbed by that, that number 2013, but, um, but what that says, right. And the way you've talked about your own process is that this book is, has been a, an event all unto itself for yep. you as, as yep. a writer. And so I'm curious, as I asked about, you know, how does a writer or sorry, how does a reader walk away from your book you know how do you think about that how do you walk away from writing this book because we all have an idea when we start a book what it's going to be about it's something different in the process of writing how do you walk differently after this book one of the things i had to remind myself and, and at least you know two of my peers have said to me prior to this conversation about how extraordinary they thought the writing was um, and, and I didn't feel that in the process. Um, but the one thing that was consistent for me that I had to remind myself in the process was just a simple adage, just tell the story, <laughs> right? The, the theory, the dates, the timeline, all that stuff will, will work itself out, yeah. but tell the story of what you're hearing. 
Mm-hmm. Tell mm-hmm. the story of what you're looking at, uh, and, and the rest will, you know, will work itself out. And that, for me, you know, in that regard, it, it felt like my most authentic writing. Mm-hmm. Right, because mm-hmm. I, I was able to tell the stories that I wanted to tell the way that I told them. Well, I hope uh, I hope you continue with that voice. I think it's uh, <laughs> a fantastic one, and it does it does make us uh, listen differently. Um, and yeah. I, I, I think cultural criticism is about you know at its best is about changing the way, not just changing what we listen to, but how we how hear we listen to it, we how we it. see it. Right. And I absolutely think this book does that. I really appreciate so much you taking time to to talk about this book. Uh, I really loved it. Um, I have a special place in my heart for uh, the Luther Vandross chapter and uh, looking for <laughs> looking Leroy. For Leroy. <laughs> but I, I, I think this book is a, is a real peak in your writing career. And uh, I know a lot of eyes will get on this book and we'll all uh, see and listen differently because I, of it. I will take tell you, thank you, John, for the invitation. You know, when you first launched this, um, and, and as you know, I've loved all the guests and all the conversations thus far in the back of my head I'm like I hope he asked me to be on the show <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you for that thank you for that I just had to find time to read the book <laughs> <laughs> alright well take care it was good to see take you take care good to see you too John <laughs> <laughs>